Hi, there everyone, thank you for joining us as we explore another interesting case in which an ECG will help us in diagnosing a very complex patient. We have a case of a 22-year-old patient brought into the emergency room having overdosed on an unknown amount of an unknown medication. She was unresponsive and needed immediate intubation. Despite her high heart rate of nearly 150 beats per minute, she was found to have low blood pressure and had vomited several times. She had shallow, rapid breathing, but other vitals were within normal limits. An immediate blood gas was done, and the only findings were a mixed respiratory and lactic acidosis with a pH of 7.1, with elevated lactate levels of 9, and pCO2 of 10.7. Her electrolytes were found to be within normal. For those still learning the arterial blood gas, the pH of less than 7.25 indicates an acidosis. We first look at the CO2 levels which in this case are elevated above the normal of 4.5 to 6 kilopascals. CO2 is acidic and lowers pH values. This would be a respiratory acidosis. It is normally counteracted by bicarbonate retention in the renal system, but in this case, the process hadn't started yet. Lactate is produced when the body is undergoing anaerobic respiration at a cellular level. It is also associated with cardiac injury. Lactate is also acidic and lowers pH of the system. You may ask why we didn't start sodium bicarbonate in this patient. It must be remembered that it is associated with higher mortality rates and is generally given according to the rule of sevens. Either when pH is less than 7 or if the potassium level is above 7. There are other circumstances where it is appropriate, but that is another discussion on its own. A toxicology screen was also taken but this would take a little while to get back to us. We are going to look at her ECG next, but, based on the information you have so far what would be your guess as to the type of medication she may have taken? Organophosphates Antidepressants Opiates Sedatives Antihypertensives It's a difficult question as there are features of each of these drugs present in the patient. Very often in the ER we are faced with this situation of knowing that a patient has overdosed but with no idea of what was taken. If you plan a career in emergency medicine, I suggest becoming familiar with toxidrones. Now, let's break down the ECG based on the principles we have learned before. In this case all of what we have learned before falls by the wayside as it is a specific pattern on the ECG, can you guess what it is? The pattern we see is called a sine wave pattern, which you may remember from trigonometry. In our patient it is associated with tachycardia. Do you know the causes of a sine wave pattern on ECG? Its most common causes are listed on the slide. I would advise you to take a screenshot for future reference. It will help you throughout your career no matter where you work. From this, we can see that organophosphates and antihypertensives are now our top contenders for a diagnosis, and we can exclude almost all the others because her potassium is normal and antidepressants are not known for causing this pattern. Normally we would look at the axis, rate and rhythm in each zone of the heart in turn. But because of this pattern such an analysis would be of no use. This shows you how important it is to know the differential diagnosis of the sine wave pattern of an ECG. Generally, a sine wave pattern will be due to an extreme increase in potassium levels. In this case, however, we know our patient overdosed on some sort of medications. So now we have our top two suspects, let's look at how each would present during overdose. First organophosphates. Excessive salivation, tearing, sweating, diarrhea. 
Meiosis, pupil constriction. Bronchospasm, difficulty breathing. Muscle twitching. Respiratory distress, due to bronchospasm and increased secretions. Initial symptoms of beta blocker and calcium channel blocker poisoning. Beta blockers. Bradycardia, slow heart rate. Hypotension, low blood pressure. Dizziness or lightheadedness. Weakness or fatigue. Bronchospasm, in asthmatic patients. Hypoglycemia, especially in children. Calcium channel blockers. Hypotension, severe in overdose. Bradycardia, heart block. Dizziness or lightheadedness. Nausea and vomiting. Shortness of breath. Swelling of feet or lower legs, in chronic use. This is not a comprehensive list of symptoms by any means, but because we didn't see any signs in this patient normally associated with organophosphate poisoning, it would be safe to assume that she overdosed on antihypertensives. This would also fit with the hypotension. The only thing is that they normally present with heart blocks and bradycardia. But the literature shows that in the hyperacute phase of presentation, they may have a tachycardia to compensate for the falling blood pressure. As the conduction system of the heart becomes more affected, they then start to drop their heart rates and blood pressure quite rapidly. If we have taken the decision that it is either a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, we can proceed with emergency management. Luckily both use an identical treatment regimen. Emergency management. Initial stabilization, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. Atropine for bradycardia. Calcium gluconate or chloride to increase calcium levels but you can omit this step if you know that it is a beta blocker. For fluids, for hypotension. Glucagon, if unresponsive to standard treatment. Vasopressors, if hypotension persists. High-dose insulin therapy, in severe cases. Activated charcoal, if ingestion is within 1 to 2 hours. Let's learn about high-dose insulin euglycemic therapy for beta blocker and calcium channel blocker poisoning. Concept uses insulin's enotropic and metabolic effects to combat severe cardiac toxicity. Initial dose, insulin bolus, 1 unit per kilogram, followed by continuous infusion, half to 1 unit per kilogram per hour. Glucose monitoring, frequent monitoring to maintain euglycemia. Glucose supplementation, 4 dextrose to prevent hypoglycemia. Potassium level monitoring, essential to avoid hypokalemia. Duration, continue until hemodynamic stability is achieved. In the end it was discovered that this patient had taken a large dose of calcium channel blockers and did well in ICU. Thank you so much for watching our video her on e, our mentorship hub. We hope you learned some valuable lessons and will be more confident in dealing with sine wave patterns on ECG in the future. If you like this video please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Please feel free to comment and we have linked to our playlist on toxicology and overdoses in the description below.